dimensional vector, where the kth entry of this vector is the frequency of the kth word in a dictionary uh, in the text document. So you look at the text document, you have a dictionary, and the kth ent entry in the vector representing the text document is the frequency of the kth word in the dictionary in, in, that do in the text document. And so we pick text documents from Science News, that's a, a scientific magazine, and we have about 1,000 text documents. We pick a dictionary of about 1,000 words, and we get the matrix of where each column is a document. And so the, I th the k entry is the frequency of the k word in that document. This is a point cloud in a thousand dimensions. And if you do that construction, you can embed it in low dimensions using eigenvectors of the graph. Every point here is a text document embedded down from 1000D to 3D. And I also color these text documents by topic. So somebody actually went, read all the text documents and said, oh, this is math, this is physics, this is medicine. And uh, these, are, these are on the top three eigenvectors. This is on the next set, th set of eigenvectors. And you see structures, almost linear structures, blobs, and so on. And different colors tend to lie in different regions of space, suggesting that you could automatically classify a lot of these documents with a very small number of labeled documents if you worked in this space. And it also suggests that the intrinsic dimension is very, very small. You can do this for handwritten pictures of digits. These are pictures of from 0 to 9 and people are interested in mapping, in learning the function from each of these images to the corresponding digit. For example, to read checks automatically, to read zip codes on letters. This is uh, uh, now standard. You go to a deposit a check in the automatic teller machine. You put in the check, it reads the amount of the check automatically. And these pictures live in about 800 dimensions, but you can embed them down in low dimensions using the technique that I mentioned before. And each point over here is one of those pictures embedded down and they're colored by the corresponding digit. So uh, dark blue is, are zeros, these are the ones, and so on. And so different digits tend to lie in different regions of space. And again, that offers hope that if you work in these low dimensional representations, you can learn that function efficiently. You can do that for the molecule as well. So if you look at long simulations of this molecule, you can construct a graph between these molecular configurations look at the random walk and do a low dimensional embedding of a set of molecules. Every point that's, this is such a low dimensional embedding, every point here corresponds to a molecular configuration. And you see that there is, well, it might seem like a beautiful manifold, but it's not. The dimension is changing. There are blobs which are pretty high dimensional. Those correspond to minima. We knew that they were higher, intrinsically higher dimensional. And there are very thin paths here, here, here. Those are the transitions between minima. And we see them map down now to 3 or 4D. This self-intersection is not real. If you go to 4D, that disappears. And so we have a representation of, uh, of the effective state space of a molecule in terms of a very small number of variables. Well, physical chemists knew that already for this molecule. There were only two degrees of freedom, and we recovered that. But they don't know how to do that for much larger molecules, why these automatic techniques have the possibility of doing that. So. Let me, um, let me just give you one piece of intuition about what this map is doing. Because this map looks sort of weird. You construct this graph, you can put the eigenvectors of a random walk and use them to embed. What is this map really doing? Well, suppose our data set had a shape like this, where there are two chunks, two clusters. Well, if you start a random walk from B and one from A, the random walkers aren't very likely to meet unless you run very, very long paths. Because a random walker started from B is going to be trapped here. It's unlikely to find this tunnel that would lead him to meet random walkers that are started from A. On the other hand, if you start random walkers from B and from C, they're going to meet very often, pretty soon. So it turns out that this sort of meeting of random walkers starting from different points is exactly what this map is, is encoding. So you can define a distance, which we call diffusion distance, it's in fact a family of distance parameterized by time. So if you have two points on your graph, the diffusion distance between x and y time t is the following. So you start at x, you run a random walk. This t is, think of it as a random walk. It's a symmetrized version thereof. So you start from x, you run your random walk for t steps. You're going to end up somewhere with some probability. So this dot here says that the destination is anything. And so this is a probability distribution of reaching the point dot, having started from x after time t. 
You can also start from Y and run T steps of the random walk, and you get a different distribution. And you can compare those two distributions. If they're close, there were many paths of length T that allow you to go from X and Y. If these two distributions are very far, it was hard to go from X and Y in T steps. Well, after you do some simple algebra in the basis of eigenvectors of the random walk, you see that this distance is comparable to the Euclidean distance between these two vectors. The vector uh, whose coordinates are the eigenvectors evaluated at X, rescaled by the corresponding eigenvalues. But these are exactly the coordinates we assign to the points according to the map that we had before. The map before was mapping X to the vector phi i of X, i from 1 to m. So Euclidean distance in the image of this diffusion map is comparable to diffusion distance on the original one. So this diffusion map is really trying to understand which points can, be, can really talk very quickly to each other by short random walks versus points which are really far away. And just to show you one such example, this is an example where you have two clusters, but their shape is kind of odd. Many clustering algorithms that try to find clusters in data would fail on this very simple two-dimensional data set because this is one cluster, this is another cluster. And why do we say that? Because if you start here, you're unlikely to end up uh, in the outer cluster. And if you start in the outer cluster, you're likely to random walk in the outer cluster but not reach the inner one. And so if you go and you construct a random walk by connecting each point to the neighbors and you do diffusion maps, this is the image that you get. You get all the points in A are over here, all the points on the circle are over here. And the first eigenvector, if you look at the level set zero of the eigenvector, says cut here, you will be obtaining two good clusters. So in this image, in the image of the diffusion maps, we see that the points in A are very far from the points on the circle, and that this line is a good separator. If we pull back this line, this line becomes, you know, maybe something like this, that cuts the inner circle from the outer one. And this can work in very high dimensions, regardless of the shape of the clusters, essentially. And so it's one of the most popular algorithms for doing clustering nowadays. So I'm running out of time. Let me go to uh, saying, oh, well, let me... Sh so we did this for molecular dynamics with great success, and we integrated this with our dimension estimation. And I wanted to just uh, conclude with two slides. This one, first of all. So this one says that uh, oftentimes we see that we're able to measure the intrinsic dimensions of data very accurately with very few samples, also when we have noise. Many data sets are intrinsically low dimensional, as proved by running this algorithm. Data is often nonlinear, even in very simple cases, and we can learn good sets of coordinates by doing these constructions on graphs based on random walks. And whenever you talk about random walks, there are Laplacians and there is Fourier analysis and there are wavelets that uh, one can construct uh, corresponding to these random walks. And one can, in fact, prove theorems about how good these coordinates are and prove theorems which are stronger than any of the manifold learning uh, constructions that uh, existed before. And then I wanted to put up a short advertisement about Eugenio has done that already, but they created a nice poster. So Eugenio and David uh, were the organizers uh, of tomorrow's workshop. And uh, there are going to be several talks, all at the intersection between harmonic analysis, vision, uh, and problems in imaging. And, um, and we'll be talking a lot about uh, also how to represent images efficiently. Images are often modeled as high dimensional data, and so problems where you try to approximate high dimensional data sets uh, in, uh, uh, by using some, sometimes tools from harmonic analysis will appear. And there will be connections with both vision and harmonic analysis. And the second advertisement is that we opened a new center at Duke uh, last year. We call it the Information Initiative at Duke, Robert Calderbank. Uh, an information theorist, both mathematician and engineer, is the director. And in the mathematics department, uh, uh, so this is a group that includes people from math, stats, computer science, and engineering. And for math, we have Robert uh, Calderbank, uh, Ingrid Obeshi, and myself, and uh, many engineers and statisticians who bring a lot of interesting challenges uh, related to high dimensional data. And I wanted to put up a side with uh, my group, uh, Duke, and uh, my collaborators in some of the work that I mentioned.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mauro, for the nice talk. Sorry for finishing late. It's not too late. Um, I noticed that there, are, there were not too many formulas until the last, the next to the last slide. Yes, I made a promise of not having <laughs> theorems and formulas. Are there any questions? Yes. Okay, you, you told that in order to uh, perform this uh, estimation of the dimension, uh, you need to use some moderator radii. Uh, do you have some explicit formulas to? Is it uh, say automatic procedure to to estimate the dimension? Ah, yes, great. So. The procedure is automated in the sense that you go through, um, so for example, your question is extremely pertinent to, say, a picture like this one that we showed before, where, you know, the question is, can you go and detect that the right range of radio that you should be looking at is this? And the answer, yes, we have an algorithm that does that. There is a gap in the theory, though. In the theory, what we promise in, uh, in the theory is that, you know, uh, if you have infinitely many points, this is actually the picture that you will get. If you have finitely many, how many do you need in order to get a picture which is really close to this? Well, we promise you and we prove that you need a number for a fixed radius and in a cer around a certain point, you need a number of points which is linear in the intrinsic dimension. But the theorem does not tell you that uh, the way that the algorithm finds the correct interval is correct with high probability. Uh, so, uh, so the algorithm does something more than the theory warrants. So, um, uh, so we never encounter problems, but there is. Uh, so, if you want an estimator for the interval of radius r, we propose one, but we don't have a guarantee for that estimator. It's uh, something that we will be very interested in in, in finishing. But right now, you know, the algorithm includes such estimator and perform exceedingly well. I'll bite again. I would love to have a, uh, a guarantee on that estimator. We, can t we have formulas in the case of manifolds for all these curves, essentially. So those we have. So there is very little that needs to be done, but it still needs to be done. Any other questions? I have one. Yes. Um, we hear these days that the National Security Agency has a lot of data collected. Yes. So, do you have any idea what they do with it? <laughs> Even if I did, I couldn't say. <laughs> but, uh, so there are lots of companies on the other end that have a lot of data, and I think we should really, really be aware of what they do with it. Uh, so, um, Facebook, for example, collects a lot of data. I was talking to his head of research uh, a couple of weeks ago, Jan Lecun, and uh, so the number of images being posted on Facebook every day is easily in the tens of millions. And on all of them, they want to perform, say, face recognition. So that if somebody takes a pictures of you uh, without you knowing somewhere on Earth, uh, then they want to let you know in case you might want to erase your face from that picture, for example. And, um, and this is a very hard problem. Face recognition till uh, three, four years ago was considered very hard. And Facebook now has the state of art in doing this. Google is just a little behind, perhaps, uh, you know, as far as I can tell. And, uh, but they have massive amounts of data. I mean, most of the pictures on Facebook arguably contain faces. And then we want to do object recognition on those. And so they're training these huge learning machines to tag objects and people in all of the pictures that are being uploaded real time. And, um, and uh, Google does similar things on your albums, I guess, on Picasa. I haven't used it in a while, but you know, it certainly tags faces. And, uh, and, uh, and Google has had image search for a long time. So you can search for any object. Amazon now with his phone, you, know, you look around and it's supposed to recognize a product just by looking at it. And so this uh, object recognition is really, is really at the stage where it's starting to become useful. Uh, the self-driving cars, similar problem. Uh, Google self-driving cars involved at least, uh, you know, have really taken off in the last six, seven years after um, the DARPA agency sort of uh, established challenges for self-driving cars uh, that sort of pushed the field uh, forward. 
and then uh, Google bought out the winning team and, uh, and now they have these cars that recognize what's around them at least as far as you know self-driving themselves and uh, at least in the US in several states now there are uh, driving tests for self-driving cars and if the self-driving cars passes the driving test like you know we would if we want to get the driver's license they're allowed to go and drive and so these things are starting to have uh, really kind of amazing impacts I think any other questions? Well, if not, thank you very much for your Thank you. Program.